Today's scripture reading comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This is the reading of God's word. Uh, Good morning. My name is Philip, and I get to serve as one of the pastors here at LFCC. Now, we're continuing our series of the book of Ephesians, and we are now finally in the very last chapter of this particular letter. And the instruction that we just read um, today is actually part of a larger set of instructions that Paul gives to the church of what a Christian household looks like. And so in this set of instructions that begins at the end of chapter 5 and continues on through chapter 6 is uh, it's really an instruction for the Christian household, and it's divided into three categories. And so two weeks ago, we saw what a relationship between a husband and wife looks like. Today, we'll be looking at the relationship between parents and children. And then next week, we'll be looking at the relationship between servants and masters. And I know this last category is very foreign to us, but it was typical in the ancient world that the servants were included when talking about the entire household. Now, there's a lot to talk about here today. And so we're just going to jump right into looking at the relationship between parents and children. And so to guide our time, these are the four points that we'll be looking at. First, What are the instructions to the children? Second, what are the instructions to the parents? Number three, we're going to look at why these instructions are actually very difficult to follow. And then lastly, we'll look at how we can start to live out this Christian uh, relationship between parents and children. So first, what are the instructions for children? In verse one, this is what it says. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. There are two instructions that we find in this, uh, in this section that we just read to the children. First is obedience, and second is honor. The literal translation of the word obey is to listen under or to follow the instructions of. And it's interesting that Paul follows this instruction by saying that it's simply the right thing to do. Obey your children for this is right. You see, there is a universal understanding that children are to obey their parents. It doesn't matter what culture you belong to or what time in human history you enter into. One thing that's consistent, that's been consistent, is the expectation for children to obey their parents. This is what we call the natural law. It's something that God has written on every single human heart for the continuation and the flourishing of human civilization. We're wired to think and live in this sort of way. And when we see disobedient children, it doesn't matter what part of the world you go to, when we see disobedient children, everyone will identify that as something that is wrong and that needs to be corrected. It is right for children to obey their parents. Now, before I move on, I just want to make a comment about obedience, because Paul here is not talking about absolute blind obedience to all things. And I have to make this clear. If a parent is instructing the child to do something that is wicked, that is wrong, that goes against the will of God, the law of God, then the child is to disobey. But those are rare occasions. The default is that children are to obey. Now, the question that gets asked oftentimes is, how long do we obey? Do we obey all of our lives, right, our entire lives? And the answer is no. There's a time when you will stop disobeying or when this instruction no longer applies to you. And we know this because Jesus in the book of Matthew says that a man will leave his father and mother and become one with his wife and will start their own household. And so the question is, when do we start disobeying? This might be a question that a lot of our youth students are asking, right? When can we be free? And I think the answer really depends on the context. Every culture has its own set age limit or set of criteria for when someone moves into adulthood. For some, 
It's right when you turn 18. For others, it's when you're financially independent and you move out of your parents' home. For many older Asian parents, it's not until you're married or until you have children, right? But I also don't think that obedience is something that you completely drop overnight. So it's not like the moment you turn 18, you can tell your parents, now I don't have to listen to you at all, right? I believe that this is a process of gradual weaning off as you gain more independence into adulthood. So think about this for a moment. The, the level of obedience that a newborn infant has to have for the parents is absolute. It's 100%. But as the child begins to grow, we hear about the terrible twos, right? When, when children begin to develop a sense of what they want and what they don't want. And so they are fighting with their parents of what they want to do, what they don't want to do. And so it goes from an absolute set of obedience to less and less, and as they get older, when they're in their middle school or in high school, the level of obedience that's, that they have is significantly less than when they started as a newborn infant. And by, by, at some point, they will come to stop. But it's important that we start with this first instruction. Children, at least if you're a minor under 18, your call from God is to obey your parents. Now, from addressing little children, Paul then moves on to the broader sense of the word child, meaning anyone who has a parent or who had a parent, meaning anyone who was or is a child of someone. He says, honor your father and your mother. This is for all believers, young and old, whether we had good parents or bad parents, the call we have is to honor our parents. And this instruction is not a natural law. Not every single person intuitively honors their parents. And so where does this come from? Well, it comes from what we call the divine law, the, the, the divine revelation. It's the fifth of the Ten Commandments. This, honor your parents, and there's no, um, there's no condition to when you can or should or shouldn't honor your parents. It says whether you have good or bad parents, in regards to what your relationship with your parents look like, honor your parents. This is God's specific instruction to all of his people, and this is God's will. Now, the word honor means to show high regard for, to respect, to uphold, to hold with value or high esteem. And here's the difference between obedience and honor. You see, obedience is following instructions. It's doing what you're told to do. But get this, obedience can be done with a begrudging heart. You can obey as a child out of obligation because you have no other choice. Honor, on the other hand, starts from the heart. It's an attitude. It's how you perceive, how you view a particular person. So your actions overflow from your heart. You see, when someone obeys you, you can observe that. But when someone honors you, you feel it. And while obedience to our parents decreases over time, honoring our parents increases as we get older. And so these are the instructions that we see. Obey your, children, obey your parents and honor your parents. What about for the parents? What are the instructions that we see for the parents? In verse 4, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This isn't exclusively to, the, to fathers, but it's to fathers and mothers, to all parents. We have here also a two-part instruction, and I see a lot of you students paying attention to this, right? What are the responsibilities of the parents? Are they doing what they're supposed to, right? And what's interesting is that for the instructions to parents, there's a negative instruction and there's a positive instruction. One is a restraint of authority, and the other is the proper use of that given authority. So let's look at the negative first. It says, first, do not provoke your children to anger. In a parallel passage we find in Colossians 3.21, it says, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. I'd like to suggest that there are at least three ways we can provoke our children to anger. First, 
We can provoke our children to anger through over-disciplining. It's when we punish them beyond what they actually deserve. It's when the measure of discipline goes beyond the misbehavior we're trying to correct. It's when we add a little dosage of spite or vengeance or frustration or anger that we lash out on the children because they've ruined our days, because we've run out of patience, because they've embarrassed us in front, in, in front of our friends and family. And this is what Dr. Lloyd-Jones says about this. He says, when you are disciplining a child, you should have first controlled yourself. What right have you to say your child, what right have you to say to your child that he needs discipline when you obviously need it yourself? Self-control, the control of temper, is an essential prerequisite in the control of others. Another way we can discourage our children is in over-parenting. It's when we have unreasonable expectations placed on our children. It's when we demand of them beyond what they're capable of. It's when we push them to the limit, requiring more than they can give. And we, ask, we see that in certain parts of the world, teen suicide rate is much higher. And what you see in those areas is that there's a, there's a push by the parents to the brink of destruction, of despair. In Psalm 103, Verses 13 and 14, this is what it says about God. He says, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. God is gentle with us. God does not expect beyond what we can give because he knows our frame. Parents, remember that at the end of the day, your children are children. They will be slow. They will make mistakes. Know their frame. And last but not least, I believe that we can also provoke our children not only through over-discipline, over-parenting, but also through under-discipline and under-disciplining. Children who've been neglected, Children who grew up with distant or absent parents often grow up resentful because they lack the parental support they needed. Kent Hughes says this in his commentary. He says, what a fragile flower a child is. He or she can be so easily crushed by his parents or he can be made to blossom beyond expectation, bringing untold joy to his parents and himself. You see, ch children need parenting, but it's the right kind of parenting they need. So then the question is, now that we've looked at what not to do, how are parents to raise up their children? In today's text, this is what it says, you are to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now the word bring up here is really interesting because it's the exact same word used in Ephesians 5.29 to talk about nourishing our bodies. It has this idea, when we're raising our children, the idea is that we're nurturing something with tenderness and care for growth. John, John Calvin translates to mean, let them, let the children be kindly cherished. And the idea is that we are to be gentle, tender, parents toward them. And it's in that context that the parents have two primary roles. First is discipline, and second is instruction. You see, disciplining is an essential part of parenting. It's a non-negotiable, and it reflects who God is as our perfect Heavenly Father. Take a look with me in Hebrews chapter 12. This is God talking about how he disciplines us, how he deals with us. Look how many times the word discipline comes up. And for many of us, when we think of discipline, we, we want to resist it. We have a negative understanding of it. But discipline is actually for the good of the person who is being disciplined. In verse 7, it says, It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what God is there, or for what son is there whom the Father does not discipline? Verse 8, it says, If you are left without discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Verse 10 says, for they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. And then verse 11, for the moment, for the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Isn't that true, children? 
but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You know, growing up, my parents had a very particular way of disciplining me and my siblings. Whenever we did something wrong, we would be called into a room, and my, parent, or my siblings would not allow to enter and spectate, right? A lot of times they would want to see. If we've gotten into a fight, you know, they want to see us get in trouble, but my parents would never allow that. Right? So we would individually go into the room. And when I would enter into the room, typically my dad would be sitting on the ground or, uh, and I would have to stand at attention. Or if it was with my mom, we would both kneel facing each other. But whatever the situation was, it was without fail. My parents would always start by asking the question, what did you do wrong? And so then I would have to tell them everything that I did wrong. right? And after we've gone through this exercise of identifying the things that I've done wrong, then came the next dreaded question. So how many spankings do you think that deserves? Right? And this was a really tricky thing. Like you, like, this is when you enter into this like, mind game, right? So you gotta like, read the room, like how angry is your mom or your dad? Or you gotta, so, so I gotta figure things out, right? Like, so what did I do wrong? What is the appropriate amount of spanking that I get? And, and this is where like, it's different between my parents. So with my mom, let's say that the, the wrong I did deserve 10 spankings, right? Um, if I said five, she would accept that number but the intensity with which she hit me would be so much more amplified to match up to the level of pain that I deserve. But if I said something like 25, then she would hit me much softer as we prolong this thing. Now, this is also a gamble because one time I remember, I said something like 30, right? I wanted to like show how remorseful I was. And so sure enough, my mom goes and she hits me, and it doesn't hurt at all, right? And in my mind, I'm like, yes, I'm getting away with this. It's like I've hacked the system, right? So I was so overjoyed in my heart, but I had to put on this like, like, like suffering like face. But in, in my moment of weakness, I burst out in laughter. <laughs> and my mom got so mad in that moment that she started to intensify her hitting for the rest of the 20 hits, right? For my dad, it's a little different. His hitting was consistent, right? It doesn't matter if it's one or a hundred, it's the same, right? So there are times when I would give a really low number, like five, and he would accept it. And I'd be like, yes, I got away with it. Other times I would try to play that, play that trick, and then he'd get offended that I gave such a low number, so he would triple the number, right? So I really had to figure out how to work the system. But without fail, every single time, one thing that I did was I pled with my, I, I pleaded with them. I said, please forgive me just this one time. I won't do it again. I won't do it again. This hurts, and I'm crying, and I'm asking my parents for forgiveness. But they would carry on. They were persistent. Now, something I'll never forget is what my mom used to do when she was disciplining us. As she was hit, so with my mom, so with my dad, he would hit us like on our leg with a stick. With my mom, she had a wooden spatula that we try to hide, right? Um, so she would use this and she would hit our old hands, right? But what I will never forget is that as she's hitting me, she's also hitting her own hand, right? And I'm thinking like, why would you hurt yourself? Like, I'm trying to get out of this. But she would hit me once, and then she would hit herself once. But I noticed that the, the level with it, which she was hitting herself was so much harder than it was for me. And as a little kid, I didn't understand that. I thought to myself, maybe my mom's punishing herself for being a bad mother, right? <laughs> but it, wasn't, it was only when I got older that I realized that there was a lot of pain that my mother was feeling as she was disciplining me. She knew that she had to discipline me. She knew that left on my own accord, if I continued to develop these bad habits, that it would lead me in a path of destruction. So her love for me required this. But she had a lot of pain as she is disciplining me. Right? No parent wants to harm their child. No loving parent wants to inflict pain. And when you see your child in pain, agonizing and crying for help, there is a level of pain that parents immediately start to feel. And so my mom would hit herself to try to remove the pain from her heart to her physical pain. And after this was all done, 
Then we would spend time in prayer. She would first pray for us, and then I would, and with like snots coming out of my nose and with tears in my eyes, say, God, forgive me, I won't do this again, right? And then be in that room again the next week. But here's the thing. One of the primary roles of a parent is to discipline their children. It's not easy. A lot of times it's consuming, not just in time, but in emotion. But it is necessary. And this we're called to do, not in our flesh, not in our anger, but in the spirit. Discipline done in the context of love, tenderness, and care produces growth. And then finally, the other responsibility of parents is instructions. As Tim Keller puts it, the essence of a parent is to be a teacher, to teach right, what is right and wrong, what is a value and what is not a value, to teach them the ways of the Lord. The goal of the parents is to raise up the children and then to send them out. You failed as a parent if you have a 50-year-old child who cannot be independent, who needs to rely on you, every moment that you're awake. Your job is to raise them out so they can become their own adults. Now, this may be hard to hear, parents, but you don't own your children. They don't belong to you. No, they are God's children. They belong to God in the same way you belong to God. You see, what we need to understand, parents, is that God has entrusted his children to you for a limited time. But soon they will grow up. They will get married. They will have their own family. They will become adults. And there will be a time when you will not be there. But our job as parents is to train them, nurture them, discipline them, so that eventually your children gain independence and in their adulthood, can continue to walk with their heavenly Father. We will not always be around, but God is with them every moment of their lives. And so the instructions for parents is do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, I know we're running out of time, so I'm just going to move to the next point, which is why, it could, why could this or why is this hard to follow? And I just want to highlight two challenges that we have in following these instructions, okay? Just two. First is the clash of cultural values. And second is our personal struggles, our personal sins. First, the clash of cultural values. I don't know if you guys realize this or not, but every culture has a defined norm of parenting that is based on the values of that culture. So for example, the way Spartans raise their children is, the way, is different from the way we raise our children in the United States, which is also different from the way that the countries uh, influenced by Confucianism raise their children in the East. Why? Because the values of each of those areas are different. Because they all have different goals in mind. Let me explain. Spartans want to raise a military society. So from a young age, all the children go through rigorous physical and military training. And so all the parenting supports that. The modern Western world values individualism, self-expression, and self-discovery. So the way we parent, parent our children is to encourage them to speak up for themselves, to be assertive, to discover what they want to do on their own. The Eastern values, the Eastern world places value on harmony, on collectivism, on honor, on family, and on respect on the elders. So the children are to know their place in society. Children are instructed not to talk amongst a group of adults. That we, are, we have this thing called filial piety, which is where we have to take care of our parents to old age, and even when they pass away, to continue on the ancestral worship. And parents also give a lot of input into what they think children should do with their lives, even when they're adults, because they believe that's their responsibility. You see, each culture has a different view of how to parent based on the values that it holds. And this is the reason why there's a lot of pain and brokenness between first and second generation relationships. 
You see, first-generation um, immigrant parents have one way of understanding what a parent-to-child relationship should look like. But the second generation grew up with a different set of values and a different understanding of what a parent-to-child relationship looks like. And these two understandings clash. And that's why we feel a lot, especially for a lot of us who are second gens or first gens or even third gens, we, we, we have a hard time with our parents or children because of this clash of values, clash of cultural values. But here's the thing, every cultural value that shapes our parenting on earth clashes with the heavenly value, with the Christian way of parenting. There is a Christian way of parenting that clashes with with all the ways here. And let me try to just get through this really quickly. The original audience of this letter that we we were reading through um, had their own understanding of parenting. Ephesus, right, is a city. It's a Roman city. It's been occupied for nearly 200 years under the Roman influence. So clearly it had a a Roman understanding of how to parent. And so each of the, so the original audience as they're listening to this, when they heard children obey your parents, they would have nodded their heads in approval. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that, right? We all agree with that. That's universal. But when it comes to parenting, now this is when people begin to viscerally react against it. And in order for us to better understand this, we have to know something about the Roman family law which gives us an insight into how parenting was done. This is called patria potestas, which is Latin for the power of a father. And you can learn more about this from a Greek historian named Dionysius Halicarnassus, who outlines this and talks about patria potestas. But this is what I want to share. In, in his commentary, a- Andrew Lincoln says this, the father functioned as a magistrate. This is the law, magistrate within the family, like a king able to impose these various penalties. The pater familias, which is a title given to the father, also had the authority to decide on the life and death of his newborn children. Weak and deformed children could be killed, usually by drowning, and unwanted daughters were often exposed or sold. All of his children reckoned to be under his control, not only those living with him, and also the children of his sons. The mother, on the other hand, had no legal power over their children. It is worth noting that a Roman master could only sell a slave once, but if a Roman father sold his child and the child became free at a later stage, the father could sell the child again. In Rome, the father's power ended with his death. Patria Potestas gave the fathers absolute power in the family. And this was protected by the law. Do you see the clash between two values here? In a patriarchal society where women and children had no rights and men walked around like gods, exercising full authority however they wanted, without any oversight or accountability, Paul comes along and he says, not if you are a Christian. Doesn't matter what the Roman law says. It doesn't, what, doesn't matter what the cultural values. If you are a child of God, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Limit the authority you have. Raise them up in a proper way. Paul says, in Christ, you have a new identity. The values that shape your parenting is no longer that of Rome, but of Christ. And the question we have to ask ourselves, parents, is this. What cultural values shape our parenting? As a youth pastor, and I was a youth pastor for about uh, eight years, and in in the last church that I served at, I had uh, 300 high school students that I oversaw. Now, in my experience as a youth pastor, I've seen all sorts of parents. And more often than not, I can tell which students are going to continue in their faith in college and which ones are going to walk away the moment you go to college. And one of the biggest giveaways was on what the parents prioritized for their children. If school, sports, extracurricular activities always came first, 
then you are training your children to prioritize that above everything else. And so when they grow up, of course they're going to prioritize school. Of course they're going to prioritize their work. As Pastor Rowe says when talking about parenting, you often reap what you sow. The question is, what are you sowing to your children? Are we instructing our children in the way of the Lord or in the way of this world? Because there is a clash. Now, the other challenge in keeping with Ephesians 6 is our personal struggle. I understand that as we come into this space and we're listening to this message, that all of us have very complex and unique relationship with our parents, with our children. And I understand that this isn't an easy, like, one-size-fits-all thing that we can apply. For some of us, we have a really hard time honoring our parents because they were such terrible, abusive parents. Maybe they still are, and you, it's best that you distance yourself from them. Maybe for others of us, we treat our children the way our parents treated us because that's all we know. And for all of us, we still struggle with this thing called sin. It gets in the way of being the sort of child or parent that we long to be. Our flesh is weak. We fail at times. We will lash out our children. Our anger will get the best of us. And so even though we know what the right thing to do, what the right thing is, we often do the opposite. And we end up hurting the very people that we love the most and we can't seem to help it. So not only do we have cultural values that conflict with the biblical values, but we also have sinful tendencies that get in the way of doing what's right. Which leads to the final point. So how can we begin to live out this relationship, this parent-to-child relationship? The clue is in this phrase. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Parents, Discipline and instruct them of the Lord. This is important. It's only when we are in Christ that we can start to experience this new way of family. Why? Because in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul explains that we were once children of disobedience. We were once dead in our sins, following the patterns of this world. We were parenting and being children according to the values of this world. But when God came into our lives, when because of his mercy, because of his love, when he brought us alive, he also gave us a new identity. Not only did God bring us alive and bring us into the light, but we're told that he also adopted us as his own children. This is really important. In Ephesians 1.5, it says, In love he predestined us for adoption. God doesn't just relate to us as a judge who forgives us for our wrongdoings, but he also adopts us and says, I am now your father. You are now my child. In Romans 8, it says, when we are in Christ, then the spirit of adoption comes upon us and we are able to cry, Abba, Father. And who is it that we're crying Abba, Father, to? It's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of the heavens and the earth with whom there is no shortcoming, with whom is perfection. When we are in Christ, God is our heavenly Father, and we're told that this Father is unlike all earthly fathers, all earthly parents. Even the best of the earthly parents, God still surpasses them all. In Luke chapter 3, we see the scene of Jesus before going out on ministry, getting baptized. Take a look at this with me. In verse 21, it says, Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were open, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. These are words that we hunger to hear from our parents from the moment we're born. To say, I love you, I am proud of you, I am pleased with you. But more often than not, we only hear these words from our parents when we achieve something. Only as a response to our accomplishments, but not with God. 
He utters these words to Jesus before Jesus could even set out on his ministry and do something to receive praise. Take a, I don't have this up here, but some of the other passages that we read about who God is as a father is this. In Lamentation chapter 3, 23 it says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. In other part of scripture, it says God is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. We're told that God is compassionate, merciful, gracious. This is the father we have in God. But then what's interesting is in Philippians chapter 2, it says that Jesus was obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross. Meaning the reason why Jesus went to the cross was because he was following the instructions of God the Father. So why would a loving father sacrifice his own son? Didn't we just talk about how good God is as a father? Why would he do it? The answer, because of his great love for you. God, in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he sent his only son. And I don't think we can begin to imagine the magnitude of the sacrifice that God the Father gave in giving up his son. You know, in my years of ministry, I've had to witness parents losing their children. I've seen parents bearing their child, something you should never see. And these were the saddest funerals I've ever attended. There are no words you can ever say to comfort them in those moments. The first time I was in the situation, I had just joined the church, and the news came out. It was at a retreat, and Peter King actually was my student, and he was there. But we got the news while we were at the retreat that one of the recent high school graduates, right before going to college during that summer, got into an accident and died. And so as soon as we came back from the retreat, I, with some of the other pastors, visited the parents' home. In that one-hour visitation, I didn't say a single word. The father and the mother just kept wailing. I've never heard that sort of grief. The wailing of loving parents having lost their child. And intermittently, they would stop to share memories of their lost son how the mother would still go into the room and smell the clothes of her son. And the father just kept, kept crying. And as they're sharing these stories, then it would trigger more emotions, which then would go back to just weeping and wailing. I don't know that there is greater pain that someone can feel than a loving parent losing their beloved child. God the Father, God the Son, enjoyed the perfect parent-child relationship of all through all eternity. But on that cross, Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the first and the only time that Jesus addresses God, not as Father, but as my God. Why? Because on that cross, the perfect relationship between the father and the son was shattered. God subjected himself to unimaginable suffering so that through their brokenness, through their crushing grief, can come healing for the rest of us. You see, Jesus in his perfect obedience was treated as though he was utterly disobedient so that all of us who were once disobedient against God can be brought into the family of God to be adopted as God's children and to enjoy the unconditional love of the perfect Father that is in heaven. 
And when you are in Christ, God says to you, before you could do anything for God, God says to you, you are my beloved daughter. You are my beloved son. And in you, I am very well pleased. And it's only when we begin to experience God's perfect love for us that we no longer require it from our parents. We can start to forgive them for their shortcomings, for their faults. And we can begin to honor our parents because this is what our Heavenly Father wants us to do. And then for the parents, it's true that we make mistakes all the time, but the gospel allows us to grow into being better parents. Yes, our sin will get in the way, but the gospel empowers us to ask for forgiveness, to repent in that moment, and to grow as a Christian parent. You know, one of the most beautiful things that I've seen in my father is his transformation over my lifetime. You see, my father and I didn't have the best of relationships growing up, but I saw that he was changing in his 40s, in his 50s, in his 60s, so that each decade became sweeter as he was being transformed to being more and more of a Christian father. We won't always be perfect children and perfect parents, but the gospel allows us to move forward. And we can enjoy this new sort of family relationship that starts with God the Father. And so it's not too late to mend broken relationships. It's not too late to ask your children for forgiveness for the wrong you've done and to pursue parenting that is in accordance with God's will. And this is my invitation to you as we go to the Lord's table, is that we reflect on this and we reflect on why it is that Christ died on the cross. 